great to be here. I'm Cathy Newman. I present Channel 4 News. Great to see so many people in the audience. And fantastic to have Sharon White, head honcho of Ofcom here, to uh, be interviewed on all sorts of things. The BBC, the new charter, Brexit, Channel 4 ownership, and of course, Great British Bake Off. So this <laughs> session is going to rise like a magnificent souffle, and there will be no soggy bottoms in sight. So, let's start with um, the Charter. And I suppose, just to put it in a nutshell, the BBC's in charge of governance, you're in charge of regulation. Sounds simple. Are you clear about where the dividing line is? Yes, well, first of all, it's fantastic to be here. Um, so, under the new regime, uh, the new BBC board is responsible for running the BBC. Ofcom is responsible for holding the BBC to account. So obviously the big change is those two roles previously merged within the BBC Trust now become uh, delinked. And three big new areas of responsibility for us. So firstly, um, you know, we will now be overseeing the, uh, news and current affairs on the BBC for impartiality and accuracy. So when Nick Robinson used to be political editor of ITV News, that used to be Ofcom. When he moved to the BBC in the past, we didn't have a role. That was a trust. In the future, we're going to be able to oversee uh, all of that. And does Nick Robinson have more to fear from you Ooh. than from the trust? Uh, you know, in terms of impartiality, for example. So, uh, I don't want to single out Nick, but you know <laughs> what I mean. I think as a regulator, you know, you t whether it's on BT or the BBC, you take your decisions independently with neither fear nor favour. And I think we will, do a, we will do a good job, we'll do a fair job. And uh, I think what this does bring is consistency between the way in which we think about ITV, Channel 4, Sky, and the BBC all under one roof. But do you think you'll have slightly sharper teeth than the Trust did? Ooh. I, um, I think... For the trust, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's broadly recognised, you know, merging the role of both being the advocate and the cheerleader for the BBC while being the set of people that are holding to the BBC to account, it was a tough gig. And so I can completely see the logic of why the government's decided to delink those two. I think actually the trust did a, 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 I do think the trust did a good job in a system that was, you know, in a, in a way, you know, they had one hand almost tied behind their back. And I think we'll do a good job too with the advantage, I hope, of a clearer deline delineation between us and, and the new board. When you think about the fact, though, that the BBC gets 10 times as many complaints as all of its rivals put together, I think I'm right in saying yes. that, um, do you think you've got the resources to manage that tsunami of complaints? <laughs> So the, the BBC gets about 250,000 complaints a year. The rest of the system combined gets about 25,000. We're obviously doing a very good job, by the way. We're doing a very good job. Um, what's important to, to realise, as I say, the BBC is going to be running, the BBC board's going to be running the BBC. So the first line of um, defence, so the, the complaints will first come into, into the BBC, not directly into Ofcom. So we are there as the appeals body... We're also the set of people that if we, we worry that something isn't quite right, we can, then, we can then step in. So we're expecting the BBC Trust itself looked closely in a detailed way at about 250 complaints out of that tsunami of a quarter of a million. And we would expect, broadly speaking, to be looking at about the same number. So roughly a doubling of the number of deep uh, investigations we do now. Isn't that a cop-out, though, to sort of describe yourself as, you know, a... a I'm putting words in your mouth, but I think you said the word backstop in an interview before. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I don't like the word backstop. Um, but what I, what I think is important to be clear in the new system is that the primary responsibility for ensuring that the BBC meets the public purposes, the, the aims, the objectives set by Parliament, great news and current affairs, great distinctive high-quality programmes... That job is principally the BBC. The job of the regulator is not to be running the BBC. My job is not being chairman of the board. It is to ensure that the BBC is held to account and we will do that job to the best of our ability. Now, you know, whether you call that a backstop or a second line of defence, um, 
I don't know. But I think the, 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 the holding to account so that audiences and viewers know that you've got a, a tough regulator, but also a fair and consistent regulator who has now got the opportunity to look at the whole of the system. Personally, I think that's a huge advantage of the new system. And have you got the resources? So resources. So um, we, uh, we're in that happy process of, um, of hiring new people. So we will be, we're an organisation of about 800 colleagues, uh, about 50 work on content and media work, and we will broadly double uh, the number of people that we have working on um, working on the TV side. And so we are recruiting like mad. The great thing is there are lots of great people who want to work uh, for us. We're also, now that the charter and agreement are out there in draft, also now designing the new rule book, so the new broadcasting framework, the new rules for how we're going to assess the impact of BBC changes on the rest of the market. So I'm, you know, it's a big... It's a big job and it's a big extension, but we don't start from scratch. And I'm, I'm confident that we'll get there by the 3rd of April. Distinctiveness is a key part of the charter. Um, how well do you think that BAME audiences are represented on Channel 4, on BBC, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry this Maybe I should well, ask on Channel, on channel <laughs> 4 <laughs> News. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely well. Um, BBC and Channel 4. Yeah. And ITV. I mean, it's interesting. When we've um, we've done a lot of uh, research, we we spend a lot of time going out and talking to audiences and viewers about what they what they love about programming and also the areas that, where they feel there's a gap. And what's interesting is that overall, people think the BBC is doing a pretty good job. They think the public service broadcasting generally is doing a pretty good job, with some very important exceptions. And the exceptions are, are roughly speaking in the areas of diversity. So if you are, I don't like the term BME personally, but if you're from an ethnic minority um, background, you don't feel that you see yourself represented. If you're from the nations, Scotland, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland, you don't feel that there are the stories that are telling your stories and news necessarily that's reflecting the news in your local areas. And so I think that for the BBC, I think it's also, as I say, more broadly true of all public service broadcasters aren't yet doing a good enough job to reflect diversity. Now, there were some fantastic exceptions. I mean, you, the Paralympics, I mean, how Channel 4 managed to beat in 2016 even the coverage for 2012 on disability, probably the area where all broadcasters probably do least well. So there's a demonstration that with the commitment we can do better, but we're not where we are. So not what, where we should be, rather. What, do, what, what, in your view, should the broadcasters do to tackle this? I mean, you know, there have been some efforts to link bonuses, uh, executive bonuses, to diversity targets. Is that a good move? Should, should broadcasters go further, link pay, for example, basically? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there is more... There are definitely, even in the year and a half since I've been at Ofcom, there are definitely more discussions and a sense that there's a greater willingness to go beyond sort of warm words to action. Personally, I'm, I mean, I'm personally interested in harder diversity targets. They're not the whole answer because we've got quotas at the moment, which mean you've got to spend money in Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland, but whether that money is actually developing sustainable creative economies in those countries, I think is a question. But I think targets have got to be combined with commitment from the commissioners and a sense that there is, a, particularly for those who are in the commercial sector, the sense that there is a strong commercial imperative there. So personally, I think targets have, have absolutely got a place in this, but it's not the whole answer. But by harder targets, you mean quotas akin to the regional quotas you've just referred to? I mean, it's a question about whether you would, as I say, I think a question whether you'd have quotas or a question about whether you would have hard targets by broadcaster. You know, obviously, uh, on the BBC side, Tony Hall has talked about beating the rest of the public service broadcasting in terms of not just what you see on your screens, but very crucially, the makeup and the diversity of the people who are making the commissioning decisions who are sitting behind the camera. And as I say, whether it's a quota or whether actually there are harder targets, I think that's something we will be keen to look at. Aren't you slightly passing the buck to the broadcasters there? Because, I mean, you at Ofcom could do more to punish the broadcasters for failing to um, live up to their verbal promises on diversity. 
So I think diversity is an area where Ofcom probably hasn't done as much um, as we might have done in the past, and certainly where I'm keen that this starts to rise further up the priority list. I do think, you know, if you're in a world where your regulator is punishing the broadcasters for failing to deliver diverse programmes, you're in a second or third best world. The ideal is that the, the you know, all of us sitting in the TV industry recognise this is not just because a regulator is saying you haven't done your homework, but actually if you're going to produce brilliant, quality, watched programmes for an increasingly diverse, multicultural society with all the issues that we know from Brexit about the di how diversity, I mean, in the broadest sense, is represented on our TV screens, that's where you want to be. You don't ideally, I think, want to be in a world where I'm issuing fines to ITV because they're failing to, or issuing fines to Tony Hall because they're failing to meet their targets. I but are you prepared to do that if the broadcasters don't get their act together I, on this? I think inevitably that's an area that we will look at enforcement, but I would like to feel that with the commitment and the regulator working constructively with the industry, we can do this because we think it is the right thing to do. Let's um, get on to the souffles and the, the sponge cakes. Um, Great British Bake Off, do you understand the anxiety people have about the shift from the BBC to Channel 4? Or for you, are you agnostic about where it airs as long as it's free to air? So the Great British Bake Off, so my, um, my family only watched two programmes together, in fact, only one and a half. The Great British Bake Off, which all four of us watched together, and Strictly Come Dancing, which my husband then goes upstairs with headphones <laughs> because he can't quite bear the music. Or so I, I could see him fulfilling exactly. the Ed Balls role in a sort of uh, much uh, skinnier way. Exactly. So the, so the Bake Off has caused trauma, mostly because of Val's exit last Wednesday. And then my older son is also trying to figure out how the new non-Sue Mel and, uh, and Mary show is going to run. On the Great British Bake Off, I mean, as a, again, as a regulator, I'm not going to have a view or express a view about the individual scheduling decisions um, that the BBC runs. And actually part of what we've seen with the Great British Bake Off moving on to Channel 4 is actually there's a, there's a market there and there's a thriving market for the independent sector. What I would say is that I do think there is a... You know, there's an, there's an important conversation about the entirety of the, of the BBC's output in terms of its distinctiveness, similarly to in terms of Channel 4, which has got very, very clear, very, very distinctive purposes in terms of diversity and encouraging the ecosystem, encouraging new ideas to come through. So, you know, I'm sure Great British Bake Off has thrived on the BBC. I shall be watching with interest to see how the new version runs on Channel 4. My interest will be to look at the BBC's output in its entirety, Channel 4's output in its entirety, and to say, actually, is there enough creativity, new ideas coming through in the whole and not just a particular programme? But this is an old idea, idea reheated on Channel 4, so is that really part of the remit to be distinctive? So, as I said, I mean, it'll be, you know, I'm fascinated to see what Channel 4 does with the Great British Bake Off, I will be interested to look at not just a single programme, but the entirety of the Channel Falls output to know whether it's still doing as it's done in the past, which is nurturing great talent. Our last health check in Channel 4 this summer, actually we gave, you know, other than concerns about programming for older children, Actually, Channel 4 is doing a pretty good job at the moment. So if it reinvests some of the profits it might make from Great British Bake Off into distinctive programming, like the news, for example, <laughs> um, then that would be quite good. I think the more that Channel 4 is able to invest in new talent, new ideas, diverse communities, new drama, great drama at the moment, but actually spend on drama is, is falling across the sector, I think that will be a, a good outcome. And in terms of the BBC and a sort of alternative um, cooking show, I mean, I noticed you were talking about the entirety of its output. That seems to suggest that you would view it as a favourable thing if there's a replacement bake-off. So, you know, it's, I guess the, the, what I'm saying is that we will not, I will not be making a judgement on individual programmes 
timing of individual programs, which channel individual programs. I don't think you want your regulator to be getting into the micromanagement of the schedules. I think what our job is, is to look at as a whole, is the, is the channel, is the broadcaster doing a great job or not? Even if your household is, is upset about there, the change. There's, there's a lot of trauma. <laughs> and I'm Let's... afraid their trauma is my trauma. <laughs> Let's move on to digital and the digital world. And I want to start with um, the European Commission's proposals on digital single market. Um, film and TV producers are concerned about their ability to sell content on an exclusively country-by-country -country basis across the EU, and they're concerned that that ability will be reduced. Do you understand those concerns? So we, sh we share those concerns, and actually it was a fascinating session listening to uh, uh, the Brexit session earlier today. So we, as a regulator, acting independently, we will be lobbying, we are lobbying, we're part of all the European groupings, uh, looking at both the proposals that have come out of Europe on the telecoms framework, but also the proposals that have come through on, uh, on AVMS. And this is one of the issues where we are in the, exactly the same place as the broadcasters and lobbying to make sure that the UK's voice continues to be effectively heard. What more should the government be doing to um, help TV producers on this? I think, I mean, I thought what was interesting from the session this morning is with all the channels that we have still got available to us, and actually I have, my experience of the last few months since the vote is that Ofcom is still a very welcome seat at the table in the various sort of European groupings that we sit and in the conversations we're having with the Commission. I think the government continue to use, continuing to use those routes. We, we lobby the government directly, and on most issues, we are in a very, we take a very, very similar line to take. Just looking at digital more broadly, um, do you think it is fair that um, shows on, you know, normal TV shows are subject to the tough regulation we've been talking about, and it is still a free for all online? So the. Um, there are different gradations of regulation depending on how close you get to watching something that looks a bit like the stuff you watch on the box, for those of us who still have boxes in our living rooms, and for those of us who, and those that look you know, close to the sort of free internet. So all our rules apply, as you know, to the TV in your front room. Some of our rules apply, much lighter form, to uh, catch-up TV. So pole dark on catch up, uh, we still regulate, but actually in a much lighter way than you know, when you watch pole dark live nine o'clock on Sunday. Now there is a debate about whether you know, the previous session actually is more, um, more of the material that's uploaded onto the internet it looks a bit more like TV than uh, cats on skateboards, whether there should be, in, in many of the Europeans' words, more of a level playing field. I am personally, uh, quite nervous about the idea of extending regulation through, through and across the internet because I worry about what that means in terms of innovation, freedom of expression. At the same time, we do have uh, a role, which we, you know, which we work very hard at, to ensure that very difficult material on the internet, so encouragement to extremism, some of the very, very difficult material abusive images, pornography, and so on. We work very closely with the Facebooks of this world to try to ensure that the internet is clear of that sort of material. But you don't have a remit over, for example, misogynistic we videos. Don't, we, do, we don't. And um, I mean, we, we spoke about this in, a bit in relation to Twitter. I think the, you know, we have no illegal um, virus at all um, in terms of the you know, in terms of most of the internet, I, as I say, I'm, I'm personally quite comfortable because I worry about creeping regulation. But I do think that, he, that while fa the Facebooks and Twitters may not have a legal obligation, they have a very strong moral obligation to ensure that the material that they are, they're on there, they're effectively on their airwaves, um, doesn't cause harm or, or offence. But arguably, without getting myself into legal difficulties, um, both Twitter and Facebook are, fa are failing in terms of, I mean, just to take misogynistic abuse for a start. Therefore, isn't that a case where the regulator should be stepping in and you have no remit to do so? We have no remit, and I agree with you 
uh, that, you know, on a, as a regular Twitter user, there is a real issue in terms of how they balance freedom of expression with some very, very difficult material. I mean, there are criminal proceedings and so on that have taken place. Do I want to be, you know, do I think Ofcom ought to be regulating Twitter and Facebook and Google? No, I don't. Do I but think... isn't that just because you don't want the sort of extra hassle and workload, no, really, I... in your heart of hearts? I mean, isn't there a consumer interest in you having more of a role? I'm not talking about the clear-cut cases which go to court. I'm talking about the regular sort of my, my concern, you know, substandard you know, my concern, My concern, other than thinking, you know, taking on the BBC is a big enough job, my concern is it's very difficult with the internet to... Uh, to have a clear cut-off line between where you've essentially got material, which is a bit like TV, and everything else. And that's why we've got this very particular definition of sort of tv light material that we do regulate. So my worry is much more about the sort of slippery slope and whether you get regulation actually where regulation shouldn't be. But the companies do need to do more. And if they don't, are you then prepared to make the argument for coming in and regulating them? At present, I'm not, no. Well, in the NAT case, aren't you prepared to lighten the regulation on the traditional broadcaster? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, you know, you can kind of argue about this. I personally think that, you know, when you switch on your TV and you've got a live TV schedule, that is a very different view and experience than when you are choosing to go online and watching a YouTube video. But and, increasingly, and that's how people no, consume And personally, I think... It's absolutely right that you've got a gradation of regulation which says, at, at the one end, actually, if I'm sitting down and watching TV with my kids, I want to know that there's a nine o'clock watershed that basically means that up to that hour, you know, it's pretty safe. I leave to make a cup of tea, they're fine. But those same kids uh, now could be getting on their iPhone devices yeah. or whatever and watching all sorts of rubbish on the internet. But as a parent, it's my job to make sure they're not watching lots of rubbish on the internet. And as a regulator, it's my job to make sure that the, at the hard end, and as they particularly where you get very, very abusive material, that we're working with the companies to make sure that's not available in the first place. I strongly believe the answer is not that domestic regulators take on responsibility for equivalent regulation of all material on the internet. I think that's a wrong... I think that's a wrong, wrong approach. Quick one. We've been talking about the new world of digital, um, the new world of Brexit. Um, did the impartiality rules affect the result? You know, the sort of fairly, very, fairly spurious claims given almost equal weight with very hard-hitting ones. Yes, it's been very interesting, the, um, the debate about whether, you know, the requirement to demonstrate sort of due impartiality means that you end up with a sort of equivalence between the two, two sides. What the due impartiality rules require is that the journalists give proper scrutiny to both sides of the argument. And my own strong view is that the rules, rather than dis discouraging proper argument and proper debate and proper, proper scrutiny, they require the journalists to take apart and scrutinise the arguments on all sides. It's due impartiality, so I know lots of, lots of people, journalists have said, well, I felt like I had to have a timer on, and if it was 56 seconds for the Remain side, it's 56 seconds for the Leave side. Those aren't the rules. So it was a journalistic fail rather than a rule fail. My, my own view is that there are two factors going on, um, not the rules, but firstly, it's a question about... Um, the, you know, the, the journalism and the, and the right scrutiny of the arguments. But I think there's a second factor going on, which is the degree to which, you know, as members of the public, we trust numbers and we trust journalists to be um, providing a fair and accurate picture of the arguments. And I think both of those issues were at, um, were at play in, in the vote. Personally, I don't think the rules were... I think it's a red herring uh, to, to point to the rules themselves. And perhaps I should say here, um, do download the app and complete the Brexit survey <laughs> and we'll have the results after lunch. Um, do you, can you share with us the, your estimate of the impact on the advertising market of Brexit? Gosh, well, my husband in about two months' time is about to do the macroeconomic forecast, <laughs> God rest his soul. Um, Just steal a march on him. Uh, who runs the Office of Budget Responsibility. I mean, I think, who knows how, um, 
how the vote itself is going to affect the macroeconomy, which is obviously you know, advertising flows tend to follow with a very close correlation the macroeconomy. I think it's a it's an it's an unknown question. Have you done any work on the likely impact on of advertising? Yeah. No, we haven't. I mean, we will wait to see how how the forecasts turn up. But also, it's just you know we are a few months from the vote. Brexit itself has not yet started to become clear, but clearly the issue about how advertising revenues run through over the coming months and years will be a key factor given its vital importance to the commercial PSBs. And particularly, I mean, for example, Channel 4, slight self-interest here. Um, given the volatility of the advertising market post-Brexit, do you think the Channel 4 uh, model is sustainable? So we've recently, just a few months ago, did our annual health check on Channel 4, which part of that annual health check is, uh, is looking at the financial sustainability. We were very satisfied that currently it is sustainable, and we will do our next health check around next summer when we'll have a, a better idea about what's happening with advertising. I'm going to um, take some questions in a second. I just want to ask one final um, quick fire. Uh, Victoria or Poldark? Oh, I love Poldark, but I have to say, second series. It's gone I've, off the boil. I've, I've, I've started to switch to Victoria <laughs> midway, midway through. Can't you watch both? <laughs> more catch-up, more catch-up TV. Great, let's have some questions. And if you could uh, spot the roving mic, and if you could please stand up so that we can see you and say who you are, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Paul Herbert Goodman Derrick. It's a question to do with the vexed issue of uh, internet regulation. Uh, the Digital Economy Bill is making its way through Parliament now. That introduces a requirement for websites showing adult content to have age verification procedures in place. Do you see a role for Ofcom as a, a regulator of that new uh, restriction? No, I don't. What, what Do you want me to expand? <laughs> well, uh, uh, there are two aspects, aren't there? There's the operational aspects of making sure that age verification is in place. And then there's the question of sanctions and enforcement if they're not. Uh, a role which perhaps you're quite well suited to. So, uh, I mean, there's, there's obviously a debate at the moment about, um, as you say, there's a sort of front end, which is... Um, the actual sort of the new rules, and then there's a back end, which is who's the body that might impose sanctions in what's a civil framework, it's not a criminal framework. And personally, I don't think Ofcom should have a role, partly because uh, we're busy with one or two other things at the moment, and partly because I don't want us as an organisation uh, getting very heavily involved in what is a, an area where other bodies like the BBFC, for example, I think have got much stronger expertise than we do. Question here, please. If you could stand up, if I could ask you to stand up, that would be great. Thank you I'm very much. Sure oh, I'm, I'm so sure sorry. I'm so sorry. Right. I'm so sorry. I didn't see that. I'm Gilbert Faraz, Portuguese journalist, veteran, commentator, and author as well. Uh, lady, my question is, being... Sorry, my problem is... Just keep going. Um, being the decision of <coughs> taking the BBC or extinguishing the, B the BBC uh, trust, being, in my view, a political and Murdoch decision, uh, isn't it too big a shoe for, the, for your organization, for Ofcom? You mean in terms of the political influence? <laughs> Well, not so much. The political influence has been from Mur Murdoch and political conservative mainly influence as extinguishing the BBC trust. So my question is, being now on, in your hands, isn't it going to be a very big show to you? Um, it's, a, it's a big job. We will act as we've always acted with complete political impartiality, complete political uh, neutrality. Certainly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing this job if I thought that um, uh, there was going to be political influence. You can't act as a regulator on, on that basis. 
Uh, question at the back, please. Hello. Oh, standing up. Um, <laughs> Sharon, it's Kent and Alan from Big Talk. I just wanted to ask you what you meant by harder targets um, for diversity. Are you advocating broadcasters ring fencing specific spend on diverse programming? Um, I mean, I'm, that's one of the proposals out there. I think what I was saying in answer to Cathy was um, there is something about as we as we take on the regulation of the BBC, which has now got a much stronger public purpose around diversity, that we will want to look quite closely at how we can make those quite hard-edged. Now, whether you've got specific targets for uh, employment or spend, whether you try to parallel the sorts of um, uh, arrangements that we have for the nations in terms of specific budgets or people, or whether, I know, and I know there's some discussion about whether one has ring fence spending or not, we will want to look at all of this closely because this is going to be an area that we will want to give, I will want personally to give a harder edge to than we have in the past. Any other hands? Um, I saw one down here. You've thought better of it. It's almost lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's getting very soporific. Um, did I see any other hands? No? Well, in that case, we have one and a half minutes left. So um, I will give you a one and a half minute head start on your lunch break. Um, afterwards, we have a keynote interview with the Chief Content Officer at Netflix, Ted Sarandos. Uh, and during the break, there is apparently an interactive technological Thing. showcase. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> in the gallery, I think. So um, apparently that's great. I haven't seen it, but apparently it's great. So thank you, the audience, for coming along and listening and asking some great questions. And thank you, Sharon, for being so giving of your time. Thank you. Thank you.